Last episode, we got our arpeggiator to sound a little more harmonious, which is more easy on the ears, but it's also pretty basic and, well, boring. And that's why I came up with a few ideas to generate more complex data for our processor. The first concept is really easy to pull off using the circuit we've already built. And yes, in case you're wondering, the circuit is identical to the one I built last time. I just decided to clean it up a bit since it was kind of a mess. Now, instead of being good boys and girls and connecting the outputs of our counter chip to the inputs of our processor in the proper order, we can just mix and match them. To start simple, uh, let's invert the order. So output four goes to input one, output three goes to input two, uh, and so on. And this is what it sounds like. After trying out some combinations, here's one that doesn't sound half bad to me. Now if I add some filter movement, crank the resonance a bit and add a few effects, it's actually starting to sound vaguely like music. If you want to change the root note of the arpeggio, there's also the option of setting one of the processor's inputs uh, high permanently. If I take input 3, for example, and just connect it straight to the power rail, the lowest note of the arpeggio will be an E. Uh, as you can hear, the changed root note really gives it a different overall feel. If that's not exciting enough for you, Here's another chip that we can use as a data source. It's called the 4015, a dual 4-bit shift register. Uh, shift registers work like this. You give it a clock signal, and for every pulse, it will look at what's happening at its input pin. If there is a high enough voltage, it registers a 1, and if there isn't, it registers a 0. On the next clock pulse, it will then take the input bits and shift it over to its first output. Another pulse and the bit shifts over to the next output, and so on. Here's the basic setup. We can use a square wave LFO as a clock signal. For the data input, I'm using a simple push button that's connected to the power rail. I've added a 100K pull-down resistor to prevent the chip from picking up noise as input if I don't press the button. All the outputs are connected to LEDs, so that we're able to monitor what's going on inside the chip. Also, we need to make sure to connect the reset pins to ground, because they like to pick up random static noise and make the chip act really irrationally. I almost threw this one out earlier because of this. So make sure you check for this if you think that yours is toast. Because we want to use both registers instead of just one, I've connected the clock inputs together. And I also send the last output of the first register to the data input of the second register. This way we are basically chaining them uh, to form a single 8-bit register. Let's check it out in build form. Now if I push this button, we should see a nice 8-step wave across these diodes. And yeah, it does work, but where it gets useful is when we turn the whole thing into a looper. To make that happen, we connect the second register's last output to the first register's data input through a diode. Now if I send in a bit, you can see it circling through the register. Uh, you can of course add more. And now what we can do is pick four of the shift register's outputs and connect them to our processor. Mm -hmm. 
now that I've found a combination that I like, we can experiment with putting more or less bits into the register. You can of course apply the same idea from earlier, where we pulled one of our processor's inputs high permanently to set a different root node. If that was a bit too wacky for your taste, here's a more conventional idea. If you've seen the first part of the series, you already know how a DAC works. This chip is basically the matching counterpart. It's an ADC, an 8-bit analog to digital converter. It takes in a voltage and translates that into bits. If we set this up and connect it to our processor, we have effectively built a CV quantizer. Uh, that will take in a voltage, it could be from my baby 16 sequencer or an LFO or any CV source really and correct that voltage to fit with the major scale. But first, we'll need to get the ADC working, and there's a few hurdles to pass there. All the chips we've been using so far work with a rather wide range of supply voltages. So we had no trouble with our 12 volt power supply as a one size fits all solution. But with this chip, it's not so simple, because it doesn't like any supply voltage greater than 10 volts. Worse yet, the recommended operating voltage is only between 4.5 and 8 volts. So we'll have to adapt here. Since we don't need something as odd and specific as our DAC's reference voltage, we can go for a simpler solution. This 7805 voltage regulator. It will transform our 12 volt supply voltage into a steady 5 volts. The setup is fairly simple. This pin here is the voltage input, uh, while this one needs to be connected to ground. And from here we get our 5 volts. So the power and ground pins are taken care of. But there's a bunch more we need to figure out. Since this chip is designed to be able to interface with some sort of microprocessor, it has quite a lot of timing and control pins. Luckily we have the option to make the chip work in standalone mode, which simplifies things a lot. To do this, we first have to pull the mode pin high by connecting it to the power rail directly. Then we pull the read and chip select pins low by connecting them to ground. This way the chip is set up to always be ready for a voltage conversion. We can ignore the interrupt pin completely, because it would normally ask for a microcontroller's attention. Since our processor is always doing the same thing with its inputs, we don't need that feature. We can also ignore the overflow output. This is used to show that the chip's input is too big to be represented with 8 bits. Since we are working with a 4-bit system, we won't be running into that problem. And here's another pin that we can ignore. It should be self-explanatory because its name is uh, no connection. This pin should be vaguely familiar from our DAC setup. It's used to set the chip's reference voltage. The idea is basically the same. We are telling the chip the voltage range that should be divided across its 256 bit states. So theoretically, if we put in 256 volts here, the chip would register each volt at the input as one bit state. But because that would also set our chip and possibly my house on fire, let's stick to a lower value. Thankfully, we don't have to be as meticulous as with the DAC's reference voltage because our processor is already doing all the heavy lifting to make sure we are in volt per octave. So I decided to just use the 5 volt supply voltage here. But uh, wait, there's another reference voltage pin. This one wasn't present on our DAC, and that's because it didn't have to deal with a possibly noisy analog input voltage. This ADC does, which is why this pin allows you to set a higher ground ceiling meaning that any voltage below the voltage that you apply here will be ignored by the chip. 
This way you can filter out a lot of unwanted noise from the input. But since we're just prototyping here and I didn't run into any real issues up until now, I just tie it to ground. Talking about the voltage input, let's discuss that setup. We could get away with just connecting our audio jack here. But to have a bit more control, let's send our input through a potentiometer configured as a voltage divider. To do that, we connect our input jack to this pin. This pin goes straight to ground, while the middle one connects to the ADC's input pin. Now we can scale down anything that we send in. You'll see how that's musically useful in a minute. One word of advice beforehand though. Since we're operating this chip from a 5 volt power supply, we need to be careful with the voltages that we send in. They shouldn't be larger than those 5 volts, because the chip might be damaged otherwise. So with our potentiometer, we can also somewhat protect our chip if we use it to cut down the input voltage. For the last pin we need to set up, we're actually dealing with the same issue. It's called the right pin, and it's used to tell the chip when to act. It works like this. As long as the voltage here is high, the chip is basically inactive. But once we go low, it will look at the input voltage. Now if we go high again, it will convert the input voltage into bits and send those out using its uh, eight outputs. Like before though, the high voltage here should not exceed our supply voltage if we don't want to risk damaging the chip. So we shouldn't just send an LFO in here like we've done before. Instead, we need to build a little bit of additional circuitry. And at the heart of that circuitry is a run-of-the-mill NPN transistor. I'm not going to go into detail on how it works, but here's a basic breakdown. The transistor has three legs, called collector, base, and emitter. Now given the naming, you'd be forgiven to think that this leg just always collects electricity and this leg emits it. But you'd be wrong. If we create a circuit like this, the LED would not light up precisely because the emitter is not emitting anything. Why is it not doing its job? That's because the leg we call base is at the same voltage level as the emitter. Zero volts or ground. Only if the base voltage is at least 0.6 volts above the emitter voltage, the emitter will start emitting, and our LED will turn on. How's that useful? Well, two things. First, our emitter is not just emitting the current collected by the collector. It is also emitting the current from the base. Um, this way, that base current gets dumped straight into ground and never reaches any sensitive chips in our circuit, for example. So we're effectively shielding everything above the collector here from possibly dangerous voltages. Uh, second, doing this actually helps us be consistent with the ADC's intended operation. Because if you remember, we said that the default state for our ADC's right pin is actually high. The operation starts when that pin is pulled low. Now if you look at just the collector leg of our transistor here, you'll notice that as long as the base voltage is zero, the collector voltage sits at a nice steady 5 volts because the path to ground is blocked. Uh, then once a clock pulse comes in through the base, the collector basically gets shorted to ground and the voltage up here drops to zero volts. When the base voltage returns to zero volts, the collector voltage goes high again because the transistor is now closed off again. There's one catch to this though. We should never short anything to ground directly. Um, that's why we need um, these two resistors limiting the current from our power rail as well as our LFO. I'm choosing my resistors by gut feeling here, which you shouldn't do unless it works. And with the two 10Ks I picked, it thankfully does. Um, finally, to monitor what's going on inside the chip, we connect some LEDs to the first four outputs here. And here's the whole thing in action. I'm sending a sequence from my Baby16 into the voltage input. And as you can see, something is happening. But sadly, we can't hear it. So let's hook those outputs up to these inputs up here.
seems like it's not that easy. Our processor stopped processing anything. Uh, that's because the measly 5 volts coming from uh, here are not enough for our logic gates to trigger. We will need to amplify the signals. There's a few ways to do it, but I'll go for the simple approach and use op amps again. If you want an op amp to amplify a voltage, you need to set it up like this. The relation between these two resistors will define the gain. If they are the same value, we're doubling our voltage, which should be plenty. So I will set up the four op amps in this TL074 with 100k resistors and connect the inputs to our ADC's outputs. Before we check what it sounds like, uh, let's try our sequence without running it through our circuit. And here's what it sounds like with our circuit active. So this is now effectively working like a CV quantizer. It's correcting the incoming CV to always be in the major scale. This is really helpful if you're trying to dial in some sequences on the fly, like in a live set, because you're basically cycling with training wheels. To hammer that point home, let's do a straight comparison. First I'll try to pick a node without quantizing. And here's how that works with quantizing active. Uh, you'll have to excuse the weird stutters. I just discovered that my sequence's output is not buffered and will sometimes flutter. Uh, do you remember the voltage divider we put in front of our ADC's voltage input? I can use this to control the resolution of the steps here uh, on my sequencer. Uh, so here's a high resolution. And here's a very low resolution. I think you can see how much further the steps are apart now. You can, of course, feed basically any voltage into our quantizer, and it will turn it into a sweet major sequence. Even something as harsh as pink noise, which I'm feeding into it right now. Uh, this way we get a constant stream of randomly generated melodies. I'm currently planning to cram all this into a module, or maybe I'll split it into two. Uh, if I do, I'll make sure to film the process and post it here, together with uh, schematics should you want to follow along. Other than that, that's all I have on this topic for now. Let me know if you have any questions, and thank you for watching.